Our message this morning comes out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 to 17. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 6 to 17. And, and just before we read this passage, just a little reminder about the context of this passage. This is one of Paul's letters to the people of Corinth, to the Christ followers in Corinth. And uh, and the the books, uh, the letters of 1 and 2 Corinthians are, are a little bit complicated in a couple of ways. One is that in first and second Corinthians, we see uh, we see Paul talking to a people with whom he did get to spend a fairly significant amount of time, uh, but not as much as he might have liked to, and, and and they struggle after he leaves with a variety of issues that face them, and Paul is finding himself having to uh, speak to them and correct some of their misconceptions, correct some of the things that stand in their way and help them to move out of their troubles and into full faithfulness and life and abundance in Christ. And so that's part of the context there. It's also part of the context, and, and don't worry about this, we'll talk about this a little bit uh, in a few moments here, but it's also true that, that theologians and, and scholars and academics have for a long time understood that the letters of first and second Corinthians as we have them in the scripture are don't necessarily represent two full separate letters but in fact they may be at least in part fragments of more letters than that and so there are parts of uh, First and Second Corinthians that that scholars think don't actually belong in the first letter of Corinth uh, to the Corinthians or the second letter in, to the Corinthians, but maybe part of a third or a fourth letter. And and, and so that that could be worrisome. We could be afraid that um, well somehow these letters are not then the inspired word of God. But that's not at all what theologians and academics and archaeologists and all that stuff are saying. They are saying instead that even so, even if these are part of three or four different letters, nonetheless, they have come to us in the state that they are, and they are inspired by the Word of God. And whether there were three letters or four letters, it doesn't matter. Uh, these are uh, from Paul, most assuredly, and inspired by the Holy Spirit, most assuredly. And so they are important for not only the people of Corinth who would have received these uh, in whatever format they did, but they are also valid and important for us as well. Now, that being said, Paul is talking about the gospel with them and warning them uh, uh, about various pitfalls that they seem to be falling into uh, and uh, guiding them out of those. And so this is what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 to 17 say. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and I would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him. Whether we are at home in the body or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but we are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than in what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. 
For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. The word of the Lord. Now, brothers and sisters, this passage is a little bit difficult for us to deal with in some ways because it is, it is complicated. It is complicated what Paul is saying here to the people of Corinth. And so it can be complicated for us as well. But it is important for us. It is important for us to see that there are several realities for us to grab hold of. One reality that Paul is touching on is the reality of the contrast between our lives here on earth, being in the body, and our lives after we pass away uh, when we are with God face to face. And you heard or, or maybe remember from other passages in Scripture where Paul indicates that for him it is it is a sacrifice. It is good for him to be alive here on earth at the time in which he's writing this. It is a Christ-like sacrifice, and it would be gain for him to be with Christ. Now, this is a, a strange, it can seem like a strange sort of teaching to us. But Paul is recognizing here the brokenness of the world and the call of Christ to be ministers of reconciliation in this broken world. And at the same time, he is recognizing that in a lot of ways for him himself, it would be better to be dead. Not because he is somehow suicidal or, or, or depressed, but because he recognizes that being dead as a Christ follower means that you are not going to hell, you are not ceasing to exist, but rather you are becoming alive in Christ and with Christ in a way that you never have been before. And there is an important truth to grab hold of there. Two important truths, really. One is that we are not to be caught up too much in the joy of this world. Hmm. That's not to say that we are not to enjoy the things of this world in some fashion, right? God gave us laughter. God gave us joy. God gave us love. God gave us so many things, family and marriage and, and singleness and, and learning and work. And all these things are gifts from God. Even the beauty of creation is a gift from God. But always lurking there is also the reality that through Adam and Eve and through our sin, this world is not as it should be. It is not as it should be. This world, the Bible tells us, is groaning as with the pangs of childbirth. And someday, someday Christ will return and will make all things new, recreating a new heaven and a new earth. And all the sin and all the tears and all the sorrow be washed away. And so in the meantime, no matter how tantalizing and beautiful and wonderful this world is, 
It is, in a sense, only a shadow. As Paul says elsewhere, now we see through a glass darkly, then we shall see face to face. And so Paul is reminding us and sharing with us that we are not to be too enamored of this world, certainly not to the exclusion of the world to come. The world to come is our hope as well. In the meantime, we work like Christ to make this world more and more reconciled to the image of Christ. And so that is why he says, as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the world, or away from the Lord, excuse, excuse me. And he says further in verse 8, I would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. But that doesn't make it okay to abandon this world. In fact, that makes the call all the stronger to live in this world and serve him. That's why Paul goes on to say, that we make it our goal, whether we are at home in the body or away from it, to please him, to please God. Paul is saying here that we need to recognize that our home is not here. We need to recognize that this world is broken and sorrowful and sinful and not what it should be and not what it will be. But he is also saying that we have been called and given the opportunity to live as Christ, serving him in this world. Now, it is interesting that Paul goes on, for we must all appear in, in verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, good or bad, whether good or bad. Now, notice that Paul is talking to believers. And this is complicated. This is interesting and Quite frankly, I don't think anybody on this earth fully understands exactly what it means. See, we believe very much in salvation by grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ. That means that you and I do not do things in order to earn our salvation or our place in the family of God. That place in the family of God is given to us by God through Jesus Christ and not by the works that we do. But at the same time, Paul is talking here and saying that we all have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ and receive what is due us for the good things or the bad things that we have done while we were here in, on earth in our bodies. So what does that mean? Does that mean that we receive salvation by grace alone through faith in Christ? Or does it mean that we earn our salvation by doing good things and we earn our punishment in hell through bad things? What does that mean, Paul? Well, the truth is, is that we do have a sure place with God. We've promised and received a place with God in his family through Christ. We have been adopted by God as his children and as co-heirs with Christ. And this will not be let go of. You will not be let go of. But it is also true that what we do here matters. It, it doesn't matter in the sense that God will reject us and say, you are not mine. 
But it does matter in the sense that if we truly love God and keep his commandments, as Jesus said earlier in the passage we looked at last week, if we obey him and love him, then we are his brothers and sisters. It's the, the whole fruit thing again, right? If we are a certain kind of tree, the kind of tree that is uh, has received salvation, then we will bear fruit and that fruit is doing good things in this world. We will not be perfect at it in this world. We will not do all of the things that God has given us the opportunity to do. We will need forgiveness, it is true, but it is also true that there will be fruit. There will be. And if there is no fruit at all, then the question arises, were you ever really in love with God? Did you ever really accept his salvation? It is a little bit nonsensical that one could imagine being saved by Christ, truly accepting his salvation, and yet nothing is there to show for it. That doesn't make sense. Just as we talked about before on numerous occasions, if you are married to someone, if you love them as your spouse, then there should be, there must be something that indicates your love. If all that you pour on to your spouse is hate and abuse and vitriol and there's never anything loving said and you even deny your spouse in front of others, then... Do you really love them? No. This is what Paul is saying. And so he says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body or whether good or bad. We will, as believers, stand in front of the judgment seat of God and we will be accountable on some level for what we have done. What that will look like exactly, I do not know. But we see in parables that Jesus gives, for example, the parable of, of the, the servants who, who took the gold that, the, that they were given and invested it or not. We see that some are rewarded greatly for what they have done, and some, some receive punishment for what they have not done. It is a bit of a mystery exactly what that will look like for the believers. However, it is certainly true that God will somehow hold us accountable while still loving us as his children. I don't know about you, but for me, that inspires fear. It did for Paul as well. In verse 11, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. Not fear as in God will reject us utterly and totally. We have already been adopted as his children. But fear as in, I want to make my father proud of me. I am afraid that he will be disappointed. I know that I am weak, but I also know his love is so great for me. And so I want to do what is good. That is why he goes on to say in verse 14, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. Right? It, it's not ultimately fear of losing salvation. It is fear of disappointing and also being compelled 
by Christ's love. We want to, because God loves us so much, we want to do what is good and pleasing to him. Brothers and sisters, this is a complicated and difficult teaching. But perhaps if you think about it in terms of your relationship with your parents, you will understand. When you were a child, or if you are still a child, perhaps you knew that certain things that you did, if they were things in disobedient to, disobedience to your parents, you knew that you would be punished for those things. You would not be rejected. You would not be kicked out of the family. You would not become uh, an alien to them, but rather you would be punished for what you had done. And at the same time, there were things that if you did them, they would bring pleasure to your parents and you would receive praise for what you had done. In neither case are you kicked out of the family or, or received into the family because you've done something good enough. But in both cases, you are doing things either out of love and respect for your parents or out of fear for their punishment when you do something wrong. Right? Whether it's as simple as stealing cookies from the cookie jar or getting great grades on your report card, whether it's achieving things that your parents always hoped you would, or whether it is having the blessing that they give for the marriage that you are about to become part of, or, or whatever it is, we have this relationship with our parents where we know their love and we know they're, they are going to keep us. We will always be family but sometimes they will punish us and sometimes they will reward us. And Paul is so convinced of this relationship that he has with God and that the Corinthians have with God and that you and I have with God that he says, Christ's love compels us, and he says, since we know what it is to the fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. And so this is a good message for us, brothers and sisters. Living out our lives as Christ followers does not mean receiving Christ's salvation and praying the prayer saying that you give your life over to Christ and then nothing else. That's not what it means. It does not mean being baptized as a child and then that's it. We're good. I've got my cosmic insurance policy and so I'm okay. No, no. It is an ongoing relationship between our Father and ourselves, between Christ our brother and ourselves, between the Holy Spirit who lives within us and ourselves, and between us and our brothers and sisters in Christ, and between us and our whole family of human beings on this earth, and between us and the creation that God gave us to care for. And it matters. Now, we have assurance in all of that. And this compels us all the more. So that in verse 16, we see Paul saying, So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view Though we once regarded Christ this way, Paul himself knows that very well, being the Pharisee of Pharisees that he was. But we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. You, brothers and sisters, you are a new creation. I, I am a new creation. The old has gone. We will not lose our relationship with God. We will not lose our salvation in him. You and I are new. 
and what we do matters. We are compelled by the love of Christ to view others as from Christ's viewpoint. And we are compelled as well by fear. We don't want to disappoint our Father in heaven. We want to do what is good and pleasing. And so Paul, Paul himself says that he is going to stay here. That even though to be with Christ, to die and go to heaven is gain, nonetheless to live here in this world is Christ. So too for us. So brothers and sisters, let us live our lives as if we are out of our mind from the world's perspective, but in our right mind for Christ. Remember, remember that because of Jesus, we are adopted into Christ's family, children of God, brothers and sisters to Christ and co-heirs with him. And his call is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That is God's perspective. Let us live to please him, compelled by his love. Let us pray. Father in heaven, Compel us by your love. Compel us to see everyone around us from your perspective. perspective. Help us to work out our salvation in fear and trembling. Help us to persuade others that they too may become children of God. whether we are considered out of our mind or in our right mind, let it be for you. O oh God, help us, O oh God, to truly live as your children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.